tomorrow at lunchtime, so you will have another chance to work with the demos. So once again, how are you feeling? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. My name is Ivan Aksanov, and I have the pleasure of running the session three. We have three wonderful, exciting speakers. And one of the joys of being a chair is actually the people that I get to meet in the organizing of it. And of course, this is an opportunity for you all to meet people. How many of you have already exchanged your contact details with at least three people? Five? Good, very good. Ten? Who has exchanged your contact details with as much as ten people? Maybe. Okay, still some work to do. It's still early. Still early, but this is really what it's all about, isn't it? It's not only here to listen, but it also to exchange. And that's really what is going to be the success of, of today and tomorrow, the whole workshop, is how much networking. And when you go back to your colleagues, and you can show them all the cards and all the contact details and all those people that you are looking forward to keeping in contact with. Now, we have three wonderful speakers, as I said, but before we start, I would like you all to think about what would you want from a CubeSat operating system? Just think about that. I'll give you a bit of maybe 30 seconds to think about what you want from an operating system. Think about a couple of things would be the minimum requirements that you would want. And now, share that idea with someone near you. I want you really to partner up. This is what it's all about. Talk to somebody near you and exchange those ideas about what you want from an operating system on a CubeSat. I'll give you one minute to exchange some ideas. And if you're sitting by yourself, just move over, find somebody. But really, exchange ideas about what you want in an operating system. If you're not talking, then you're not working. Wonderful. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Christian Freitinker from PT Scientists. And Christian is going to talk to you about one of the things he's very passionate about because for a long time he's loved electronics, absolutely adored playing with electronics. And he would probably be doing it all day, 24 by 7, if it wasn't for the fact that he had a young family as well to have to look after. Today he's going to be talking about motivating you, hoping that you will go away and want to drive test Rodos. And Rodos is a CubeSat real-time kernel operating system. I would like you all to make Christian, feel very, very welcome. Please, big, warm <laughs> applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Hello. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. The expectations are high, I guess. <laughs> but uh, before, um, before we get to the nice and nerdy stuff, let me give a quick introduction to PT scientists and what we are doing. PT Scientist was found by Robert Böhme in 2008, originally to take part at the Google Lunar X Prize. 
Our office and workshops um, are located in Berlin, in the heart of Marzahn. Originally I'm from Austria, but I love Berlin and that's why it's uh, nice to work there as well. Today we are a team of 35 scientists and engineers and yes, also some business developers and uh, people working in administration. A part of the team can be seen here at the launch event last year in Berlin. Together with Audi and Vodafone, we established the mission to the moon as an own brand. Our mission goals are to show that it is possible to land on the moon with a commercial background. We are not doing scientific experiments. That is the stuff we are leaving to universities and institutes who know their stuff. We are just providing the transportation capabilities. With the first mission, we want to return to the Apollo 17 landing site to take some nice pictures and of course to prove that the Americans really landed there. We also want to show that it is possible to conduct such a complex mission with limited budget by the use of COTS components and strong support from the non-space industry. But we also know that critical parts um, have to uh, reach uh, at least TRL-9, okay, at least that's the topmost already, um, that uh, to be used on a system which shall land on the moon, because otherwise it's going to be too much of a game, like the propulsion system. That's definitely something we need TRL-9. Alina is our landing module, which will hopefully soft land and deploy two Audi Lunar Quattro rovers on the surface of the moon. An interesting aspect is also, among a lot of others of course, that we will operate the first LTE base station on the moon as a tech demo in cooperation with Vodafone. It is important for us to bring the costs down through the use of widely available and standardized technology instead of using proprietary space solutions like space wire and stuff like that it's easier to use ethernet udp in the cubesat scene that's really common but for such a mission it's not too easy to achieve that this approach is not new of course to a cubesat scene um, for example we have to use ccsds which is mandatory when using the s track network for communication, so we, ne we cannot in every aspect rely on uh, standardized technology. Of course, CCSDS is always standard, but in the space segment. Our self-developed data processing model also helps us to bring the costs down. We always have reusability and modularity in mind when designing our systems. With its Smart Fusion 2 system on chip, which includes a FPGA fabric and a Cortex M3 microcontroller subsystem core. We can use it very, it very flexible for all kinds of data processing and interfacing. The same board, but with different uh, software and FPGA cores, is used, for example, as a flight computer in Alina, as onboard computer in Alina, but as well as a video front end interfacing the camera sensors in the rover. RODOS, which is used as operating system on our data processing model, perfectly supports our needs in terms of flexibility and fast development cycles. Maybe that could be a new standard, RODOS with our computing model, who knows. But now let me come to the key features of RODOS. It's a real-time embedded operating system designed for dependability developed by Sergio Montenegro and his team at the University of Würzburg. Originally it comes from the DLR, but as far as I know the um, source is now handed over to the U University of Würzburg. Simplicity is the core to achieve this dependability. The API offers object-oriented C++ interfaces, priority-based preemptive scheduling, and round-robin for same priority threads. A middleware, which also comes with the Rodos distribution, offers flexible communication based on publisher-subscriber protocol. Also, ports for different bare metal platforms exist, 
we had to port it to our Smart Fusion 2, which was a good exercise for us as we got to know the kernel and especially the hardware abstraction layer very well. Beside the ports for pair metal platforms, it can also run on top of Linux, Windows, Mac OS and on every other POSIX compatible operating system. That is a very important feature for us because it speeds up the development cycle a lot and simplifies it, uh, simplifies it a lot. But what are the reasons which convinced us to use Rodos for our spacecrafts? First of all, it offers everything we were looking for. Like high flexibility due to integrated middleware, applications can be developed independently. Of course, they don't, uh, as long as they don't rely on each other. Development, testing and debugging is much easier on Linux than on bare metal. Also important building blocks like a CCS DS converter or a command handler exist already and can e easily be adapted to our needs. Um, it is in operational use already on satellites, which were launched over the last few years. And last but not least, for me personally very important, is the really good cooperation and support from Mr. Montenegro and his team. Obviously he's not here, but that is really nice work together with him. So now let's have a closer look how Rodos works. The central element in Rodos core is the time. It starts at zero at boot time and increments continuously in nanosecond steps until the end of time. All threads are started at boot time already. A thread may run until it's suspended for a time period by itself or by another thread. A thread can be resumed periodically like thread D or at a specific specified point in time like thread C, a thread can also be resumed by an event like thread A. Rodos is designed to support fault tolerance, that is what the middleware takes care of. Threads can exchange messages using a publisher subscriber protocol. The middleware distributes messages locally in each computing node and using gateways it may even cross node boundaries to reach all units in the network. That gives very high flexibility and users do not have to differentiate between local and remote communication and between software and hardware communication. Therefore, units may appear, disappear, tasks may, may be migrated, activated or deactivated at any time. Even the position of applications can change at runtime. Each data transfer is resolved just in time using the registered communication topics. So, we haven't seen a lot of source code yet, but here is a small piece. This piece of code uh, is the most simple example of a Rodos thread. A thread is a small building block of a Rodos application. Thread execute tasks once or repeatedly or react on events. But first of all, of course, in order to use the Rodos, fu Rodos function and classes, the header has to be included. The Hello World class in this example is derived from the thread class. And every thread has at least to implement the virtual method run, which contains the actual thread task. Threads are not instantiated at runtime, but as global variables. At compilation time, they are automatically added to the Rodos scheduler and called according to the task, which in this case, case gives the output on the right side. This example implements the basic structure of a Rodos program. Threads can be grouped under common application. Here the app is called model 2 with the name test time add. Also a constructor has been added which gives the thread a name. Priority is also optional. Also the init function has been implemented. This, me this method is called after all constructors are executed and before the threads are activated. Here all necessary initiali initialization has to be done. It can be seen how time dependent processes can be modeled in Rodos. This example also demonstrates how to do something at a specific point in time 
after a defined amount of time and periodically. Therefore, Rodos offers different macros like add, now and time loop, which are used here. That was a very short introduction, introduction to Rodos. As you might expect, there's much more I could talk about, especially the middleware, but I just wanted to give a, a quick teaser here. There's really good documentation and loads of um, examples out there, which come with the Rodos distribution. But let's end that here and let me give you a quick overview what other open source software projects we're using and maintaining at PT Scientists. Very interesting for those of you who are developing FPGA course is PSHTL, uh, developed and maintained by my colleague Carsten Becker. Um, yeah, that's the easy version of VHDL, it looks a bit like C and Java and generates VHDL, but that's what we are using on a daily basis to write our IP course. It even generates the API uh, in C. Another interesting uh, project is mutation testing by Alex Denisov. Um, this mutation testing framework was also used with the Rodos core already. Um, that's the other good thing with open source projects. If you're using one open source project, project it attracts other open source projects. And yeah, but now let me come to an end. Mission control system framework, that's also a good point. We just started a few weeks ago. Yes, then thanks a lot. And if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, then I have one. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> uh, is there any planned timetable to actually put one on up for launch? Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, not earlier than 2019 is all I can say at the moment. But we are planning for 2019. It's very soon. Very good. That's very soon. That's right. Yeah. That's why we are quite stressed with development. <laughs> <laughs> good. And we have another question here. Uh, Daniel Stefflos, please come check. Thank you for the presentation. I will perhaps challenge you. Wh why do we need yet another operating system? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we did some research on existing operating systems already, like Free Atos. Uh, there's loads out there. Uh, the thing here is. Um, the this this uh, publisher su subscriber approach is very important for us. The flexibility to spread the yeah, comp uh, algorithms uh, over different computing nodes. If you have too less computing power, you just add another node. Okay, it sounds a bit simpler than it is in the in uh, real life then, but um, yeah, for us it just offers everything we need and the good support from. Mr. Montenegro, and it's out there for quite a while already. So it's not really new, I think it's 15 years old already. Any more questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Klaus, I'm sorry. Uh, a little bit on the same on the same topic, um, uh, you, you talked uh, about the flexibility of Rodos and that you can shift tasks from one node to another and stuff like that. I, ca I can imagine that is uh, is quite tough to verify, though, uh, in a, in a yeah in a way to to verify the the correctness of these uh, things. How 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 are you approaching that? I mean, our case, for example, this uh, processing module I presented, that is one half of our redundant onboard computer. So the same computing module, zigzag, uh, is is connected together with the other one. And um, both models run the same software. The only the one is monitor, the other one is the um, uh, worker. And in that case, you can just run. Okay, here you don't uh, switch uh, one task; you switch the whole machine over. So we are, we are not using that in such a fine granular way, but it would be possible. Could you say something about the 
the name of uh, PT scientists and where that came from? <laughs> yeah. Uh, originally, uh, we are, although our company is named part-time scientists, but as we work more overtime than part-time, <laughs> Um, uh, we try to establish uh, PT scientists instead of part-time scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Very but good. PT doesn't uh, really stand for anything at the moment. Okay, Our and sometimes it's known as PTS, I heard. Yeah, that's the short form, that's right, yeah, yeah PTS. <laughs> it's quicker. Any further questions? Then please make Christian welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to make a note that there is a change in the program. The next speaker was scheduled to be Stefan Bush. He was unfortunately not able to make it, but the good news is it was a great opportunity for Oliver Roof to come in. Now, Oliver is no stranger to ESOC because some two years ago he was in the YGT program, and our next speaker has had the like time, 18 months he's been here at ESOC and I think this was a great opportunity I hear to come back and visit and I think he's very, very happy to, to join us all here now. So what is Oliver going to be talking about? Now I've got it down that he really is you know, excited about the EEIO and I think that just makes it very like that. And I think the question is, what the heck is the EEIO? Well get this, efficient electrical interface, open source, otherwise you wouldn't have got in. Standard for CubeSats. Please welcome warmly Oliver. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you very much, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, welcome to my talk. I'll give it not being an expert on this topic on behalf of my colleague who can't make it today, but uh, I hope I can answer most of your questions. Uh, if not, uh, we can share or keep in touch afterwards. So let's jump right in to the topic. What's the motivation for a standardization of an efficient electrical interface of CubeSets? Um, I studied at the University of Würzburg. Right now I'm uh, working for the ZFT, which is also based in Würzburg. Uh, you can see the logos up there and um, the satellite projects from this university back in 2005 was Uber One and you can see uh, Uber One during the integration there and it looks like a mess, doesn't it? I mean there's a lot of cables coming out, no one knows where they go and what they really do and uh, I can tell you uh, Uber One was integrated for several weeks and it was working for several weeks but uh, for the next generation, over two, uh, I think one or two years later, uh, they doubled the integration time because they added more complexity to the system. But what happened? It just worked half of the time Uwe one did. So uh, the scientists figured out there's a problem. We need to figure out how Uwe X will look like. And we can't do just uh, the same on and on and again and add more complexity to the system. So this was our own view. If we, if we go a level up, there is like uh, this year, 447 CubeSats are launched uh, and all those CubeSats have to be tested. And the thing what Arthur said early in the morning already is that only 40 to 50% of all CubeSats uh, reach their primary mission objective in orbit. And there are some key aspects just listed in here. What, what, what is uh, important for the future? Performance, durability, we need a fast development cycle if we want to have more and more CubeSats in constellations and formations. And we also need to take into account how we want to produce them, how we make sure, how we can verify that all those systems work in the end. So probably we need to put in automation into this topic and this won't work if you have so many cables coming out of a cube set. So um, we think that standardization is the key to the economical utilization of small satellites 
And basically what we have right now in the uh, satellite or CubeSat community is the same we have here for the power supply in the different countries. Uh, but if we would have a standardization, then we would have fast and reliable development, integration, verification, and we would increase the testability. So an engineer would just easily go there and test the system instead of just simulate it, and this would therefore increase the robustness. Uh, so the chances of a standardization of a CubeSat interface or subsystem interface is efficiency, flexibility, and robustness, in my opinion, what we want to increase. Uh, efficiency in order of fast and compact integration and development cycle, flexibility, if we want to have uh, for one mission a one-unit CubeSat in the other mission, we want to have a six-unit CubeSat just because the payload is bigger, we want to use and reuse the same systems. And with a standard, we can do that. And robustness, as I said, in order to uh, increase the testability. So let's go in. What happened uh, for Uber 3? Um, so my colleague was looking at current approaches, and what he found was PC-104. I think everyone who is in charge of building a satellite has heard of this standard. And uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about to say or to tell you it's not a standard, sorry. Uh, it's just a bus system and it was never meant to fly in space. Uh, so therefore PC-104 has many drawbacks um, that are listed here. For example, um, that of those 104 signals, there are many undefined and many are not constant consistently used by the different vendors that are out there. Um, there is also a very large connector um, which makes up 15% of the board space and of the inter-subsystem space. Um, it just makes a lot of problems and you still need um, extra harnessing for the flight kill switch logic, for test and debug interfaces and so on. Um, there are also uh, missing signals, so there is no um, no signal for time and clock synchronization between the subsystem foreseen on the PC-104. And uh, there's absolutely no support for redundancy concepts. That's why um, for Uwe 3, um, there was the basically Uwe bus or Unisec bus, as it is called right now. Um, yeah, I should mention that Unisec is um, from Japan uh, or from Asia a consortium of universities. There are more than 100 universities uh, in this consortium and they um, basically agree on, on different things, how to make space more uh, achievable for students and so on. And this is one thing because the standard uh, also allows you or your students to, to just dive into the problem and don't care about how the interconnection between the subsystem works, but your subsystem, the student probably is in charge of, he can develop it easily. So the Unisec bus is basically a modular uh, architecture which is based on a backplane. It has uh, debug support for any microcontrollers and uh, on all subsystems via OBC. So the OBC can, uh, if it is needed, reprogram any subsystem at any time. Um, we have a full access to each subsystem implement implemented via the umbilical line, even when the satellite is fully integrated. So you don't need to go through the OBC to reach a subsystem. You just put in your debug port and you can reach any subsystem you want through one port. And uh, s um, you have an external debug interface on each subsystem for the development time. Um, yeah. The digital communication is um, made up of uh, dedicated signal lines um, for the onboard computer to control the communication and the electronic power system module because they are the most important for our satellite to work. Uh, it's not like on PC-104 where there's one or two I2C buses or CAN buses and they're all connected to each other. There is one dedicated for the OBC to come and one for the OBC to EB EPS. Um, then there are two more I2C standard 
rate low power consumption uh, I square C buses uh, for the subsystems and for the OBC to the subsystems and for um, high data rates we can achieve up to 500 megabit per second with the MLBDS bus. Also there's a line for time synchronization basically this is pulse per second we can share between the subsystems. Um, yeah one great uh, opportunity of this bus is that it allows to bring more um, intelligence to our power generation modules. So uh, the solar cells we are using are more intelligent than usual ones. They have their maximum power point circuitry um, just implemented on board. So um, the, the, the yeah, benefit from this is that you can have a, um, unregulated power bus where each subsystem is is just uh, added to and it doesn't matter where we put our panels in each connector is the same it's the same bus um, principle and um, yeah this is the distributed power generation and there's also the distributed power distribution so each subsystem monitors its own um, power uh, for example if there's over voltage under voltage a latch up the subsystem itself knows when this happens. And uh, this helps you that you don't need to know this when you're developing your EPS beforehand. You probably don't know how much uh, current your subsystem needs in order to work. Um, with this solution, your subsystem self mon uh, monitors yourself, um, itself, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. There's also uh, isolation of the data interface from satellite bus. Imagine if your subsystem X is not working anymore and uh, the OBC decides to switch it switches it off. Um, then um, the I square C bus, for example, could power still the subsystem if you don't have an isolation isolation uh, switch included. And this is also done in the subsystem. I will jump now right into uh, a subsystem. This is the ADCS, how it looks like. And this is basically the four points I already mentioned. So um, we have this power control circuit on uh, the right, which monitors the whole power. Then we have the interface control circuit, which is controlled by the OBC. Um, in order to select the bus and give um, the subsystem the ability to talk to the bus or take the ability. Then we have this very small connector. You can also see it back uh, uh, on the back side of the room. I have some uh, samples with me, um, which just doesn't drive in the end the um, design of your satellite as PC104 connector would do. And uh, we also have an external debug interface integrated on each subsystem. Of course, if you would need the space, you could leave it out. But we think this is a benefit. So you could uh, or you can um, um, power your, your subsystem as a standalone um, solution just by a USB port, which you can also use for debugging. And um, yeah, what we created, for example, you can see it also in the back, uh, is the satellite development board which is basically a flat sun model and um, yeah you can have uh, access to all of the signals on the bus very easily we have also a microcontroller included uh, to simulate anything and to come to an end the best of it it's all open source you can download the specifications here I also have some flyers in the bag, so everyone who's interested can take one. And uh, with the video of the integration of Uber 3, which was done within two hours, and it's running since four years now in space without any interruptions, I want to conclude my presentation. Thank you. And do we have any questions for Oliver? Yeah. Um, microphone, one moment, we'll get one. 
Hey, uh, so you're talking about uh, open source standard bus, and my question is: Do you also provide some open source uh, open source hardware that is compliant to that bus, or is it just a specification? Um, so what we provide is uh, the CAD models um, and the, the the subsystem, as as I just said, is made up of, for example, this power uh, monitoring circuitry and this se bus selection circuitry, and this is all part of the open source. So this is, um, if you would uh, want to use this bus system as well, you can approach us, and we would give you some, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, um, layout of a board which includes already these parts and you have to of course depending on your payload or what you want to put there you have to um, change maybe the resistors that are in charge of monitoring monitoring the power or you can leave out the debug port as I said but this is also open sourced yeah but just to make it clear we also sell for example an board computer which is based on this bus or an attitude and um, determination and control system, which is based on this bus system, they are obviously not open source, otherwise we couldn't sell them. Um, but you can... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's not my decision. Uh, we have to talk to my boss then. <laughs> um. One moment. Can we just get a microphone to yeah. you? Just so that everyone can hear what you're saying. Let's see. It's not kind of an open source. Yeah, that's uh, is something that I realize I you are not the only one. Many people say they are open source, and this is something I criticize very big, that they say we are open source, but they only send some pictures. That's not open source. Um, so here what's definitely open source is the interface um, definition and the standard. Uh, what you do with this interface is up to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I just can say that uh, this is basically uh, from 10 years of experience rise this um, agreement to do the bus like it is right now, and it's working. So we made it public, and everyone can benefit from that. But uh, we don't want to develop each subsystem for everyone. If you have your own payload, you just use the bus and then uh, you can be sure it is working, the bus in the end. But we don't want to guarantee that your payload is working, for example, um, that you're building on top of that. Yeah. Any further questions, please? Um, the back pain architecture, it seems really good for one new CubeSats. And have you already tried to apply this for 3U or 12U CubeSats? Um, so currently we have several projects going on that are um, um, CubeSats uh, with three units and we are, um, as I said, this is a standard which is uh, scalable, so it's easily extendable to three units and more. However, for a 12 unit CubeSat, uh, I, I would say it depends on the specifications, yeah. It, it would work for sure, but maybe there's a better solution than instead of using a backplane because you would lose a lot of, maybe you can use kind of a f flex uh, rigid bus in the end or something. Okay. Another question. Uh, so the standards, your standards looks really good. Uh, if we compare to the PC, uh, 104, um, but do, do you know if uh, manufacturers and equipment providers, uh, some of them, are interested in your standard? Have so you been contacted? And yeah, we're we're in contact with all of them. Um, <laughs> all of them are very excited about this standard. The problem is, as long as no one is paying for it, they obviously won't include it in their portfolio. But uh, for example, if you would um, approach Clydespace, for example, uh, they're very interested in implementing the standard for their um, um, subsystems as well, and we're in, in close contact, or Hyperion, or, um, yeah, I, I think everyone is um, interested in standardizing 
because then you also have more competition on the market and you can buy the 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 OBC which suits you best and not the one which the vendor thinks suits you best. If you need a low power OBC, you buy it from this one and you bought the battery module from this one and your payload you create your own yeah this is the idea <laughs> the dream thank you very much thank you. hyperset hyperset Hyperset. Our next speaker is the very colourful and experienced, somebody who started their career with a mishap. Somebody that's continued to learn and grow, somebody who can tell great stories, is Thomas Zawistowski. Now, Thomas is going to share with us some of his stories, and in particular, he's going to tell us about Hypersat, a new standard for hardware and software in the Microsat platform. Please welcome Tom. Thank you very much. Um, to, since he introduced me as a great storyteller, so I have to start the story. Uh, the mishap was uh, crap. This was the project I uh, worked on. Uh, the project I worked on uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center, and uh, that was the uh, Comet Rendezvous asteroid flyby mission uh, that unfortunately got uh, scrapped after three years of hard work. And uh, that was at the beginning of the 90s, it was the very first time I learned the concept that someone came up with saying, why build big and expensive satellites that never fly? Let's build something small. But as you realize, it was many, many years ago. The technology wasn't up to snuff. It, it was still the story of the future. But time passed, and uh, I already had a chance to run a project uh, building small nanosats. And now I'm on another one. So uh, this one is a hypersat uh, uh, that is a brainchild of the systems engineer that didn't come, unfortunately. Uh, his name is Marcin Stolarski. He came up with an idea of building something bigger than a CubeSat, something that would be uh, easily reconfigurable uh, and it could uh, perform like a real satellite uh, compared to CubeSat, since it would be doing real stuff. Uh, I'm not saying that CubeSats don't do real stuff, but uh, that would be something bigger. Um, so let's get moving and uh, let me show the next slide. If I yeah. So this is what Martin looks like. Uh, he's expecting, uh, his wife is expecting a baby, that's the main reason he didn't come. But let's concentrate on uh, the characteristics of that uh, invention. Uh, so let's go uh, by items so deliver something that would be a bus we will deliver and build a uh, carriage that uh, one could put a uh, instrument on so the only thing that the uh, instrument provider would care about is the connection so we tell them we have a standard so this is another idea behind the story build standard so we are looking around i looked uh, and listened to the uh, um, presentations before, and that's exactly what we are trying to uh, follow. So, scalable architecture, yes, we are starting with something called 1HU, hyper, weight un hyper set unit 1, and then go up. And then we go through uh, open software, op open hardware concept. Uh, we want to be reconfigurable in orbit. Anything happens, uh, we can switch. We were talking about the safe frequency. I was working on the Bright project. Uh, that was uh, having uh, tremendous problems at uh, the amateur uh, UHF 435 megahertz uh, uh, range. Uh, lots of noise, we are having lots of problems. Now having an SDR on board would be different. You could just reconfigure, uh, switch frequencies and uh, here you are. Um, then uh, we are trying to follow 
ECSS and CSSDS. Um, one thing that uh, we are very uh, uh, firm about is trying to make this a reliable uh, project, a reliable bus. Uh, it is difficult if you buy something which is cheap, but uh, we started to think in terms of reliability and quality starting from scratch. So uh, one of, of the ideas that we are trying to follow is that uh, we will follow regular ESA-based standard quality procedure. So we have regular reviews starting from day one uh, with the uh, risk planning and uh, all the software uh, that supports it. We are trying to use the uh, model-based systems engineering uh, software that is being introduced these days. Uh, so uh, there are some uh, new aspects to something that we used to be doing before. Um, another thing is using COTS uh, that will make things uh, inexpensive. Um, and fast to launch, uh, the idea is to have uh, a product which is offered to uh, uh, the payload provider uh, who cares about delivering his stuff, but we want to say, yes, we are ready to launch in six months. Um, the other way. Let's go. Um, the team that's building it uh, is created by Creotech. This is the company I come from, uh, but this is the company I left. Uh, at the Institute, the Space Research Institute. This is the uh, Warsaw uh, uh, University of Technology. Some examples. So this is the ESA certified uh, uh, the production PC flight qualified production line. Uh, this is the project uh, I ran before, uh, the uh, stargazing uh, uh, telescope, the smallest telescope in the sky these days. This is what the uh, Warsaw uh, University of Technology launched, um, uh, PWSET-1. Now they are building another one. Actually, uh, Dave Evans uh, ran the CDR for, for their mission. They are ready to uh, launch with uh, Elon Musk next year. Uh, Creotech worked on ASIM, which is put on uh, International Space Station. Uh, I ran the ICASIS, which is the Mars uh, uh, ExoMars uh, stereoscopic camera project. This was the uh, power supply. And this is uh, another uh, mm, uh, thing that was done at uh, Space, Re Space Research Center. We provided a penetrator uh, called MUPUS on the philia that landed on the, uh, on, on the comet. Um, so we have experience uh, how to uh, build instrumentation. Now we're trying to build our own uh, bus standard. So uh, look, uh, looking at the market, uh, we looked uh, what's the expect what the expectations are and uh, looked at the uh, payload uh, expectations, mainly in the teledetection area, and finally uh, came up with uh, a range of uh, parameters. So you could probably sum it up uh, with uh, a range f up to 15 kilos, uh, then power is about 35 watts uh, that uh, you would get from uh, 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 the system which has no extendable panels, and uh, then the downlink is from uh, kilobits to 10 megabits. So uh, the summing it up is a need for something bigger and something more powerful, something with bigger throughput. Um, so this is the answer. When you look at the green stuff at the very bottom, this is uh, uh, scalable CubeSat. One, two, three U's and so on and so forth. When you start here, you have a standard. When you come to here, you have a real uh, individualized solution. It's very difficult to make it uh, standard. What we said is we will have a standard here, but we also have a standard at 6U, so everything will be standardized. So the idea is to have a standard bus uh, that we provide, and then what payload does is just connects the standardized connector. So whatever is uh, on board uh, is standard. W well, we're not responsible for the standard of the payload, but the whatever is beneath is, uh, is standardized. Um, we are doing tailored ECSS. Not everything can be standardized, as you know, but uh, for example, uh, power would be 3.3, uh, uh, 12, and 28. Uh, so this is uh, a space VPX standard. 
uh, the one example of some telescope which is put on uh, on our bus with extendable uh, panels. By the way, um, a set of parameters so you can see uh, a range of mass. Uh, mass of from 10 to 60 kilograms, then the size is 35 on the size on the on the side, and then grows from 10 to 60. Uh, uh, then you see power, uh, then uh, the uh, desirable throughput 50 megabits uh, on S and X. Um, as far as AOCS, uh, depending whether we have a star tracker or not, so it could go down to say 10 uh, arc seconds. Um, then, as far as the bus standard, uh, what we are looking at were several different standards and we decided to go for specs, space VPX uh, for several reasons. I mean, uh, what we are preparing for our first review uh, that will be done uh, is a very thorough uh, explanation of what is the motivation, why we chose that particular standard and not the others. Uh, one of the reasons is it's already proven uh, it's being used in avionics. It's more durable than uh, micro TCX. We, we talked to NASA, we talked to uh, Los Alamos and different people working on different standards and decided that uh, going space VPX is uh, really uh, something that would be more m most uh, uh, promising for the future. Uh, as far as protocol, communications protocol, it will be space wire and launch readiness uh, six months. Uh, this is what the bus looks like. Um, doesn't probably show very well, but this is the bus and to the bus you can uh, attach adapters through some converters if this if this is a prototype thing uh, or here for CubeSat bus adapters. Everything else is something that we deliver. Uh, so from uh, OBDH, OBC, OBDH, AOC, uh, then uh, power, then the radio, then uh, MGSC and EGSC. Uh, there's also a separation system shown probably on the next, no, the following slide. This one uh, will show the structure. Um, so you can see a typical one hyperset unit. Uh, there will be uh, three rows of crates. This is where the radio sits since uh, it will radiate uh, um, heat uh, to the bottom plate and this is where the bus adapter uh, will be mounted. Uh, there's still some room here. Uh, this could be uh, batteries, but uh, this is space for reaction wheels. And then uh, you could put uh, everything else on top, like uh, the payload, uh, whatever the customer wants. Uh, okay, let's go further. Uh, some more, some from one to six. Uh, this is, by the way, already booked mission for astronomy. Uh, that uh, we are asked to fly. Uh, the separation system, uh, we looked at different standards, uh, looked at MARM and probably will go for a clamping system. Hypersat bus, uh, the idea is the switch. The switch is uh, micro semi and it's uh, I2C uh, that will be working in two modes. This is uh, uh, addressable and uh, a watchdog. And then on top of that, uh, th there will be space wire. Uh, that will be on LVDS and uh, 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 that will be Smart Fusion FPGA. Uh, here you have uh, Space VPX, another top uh, example of uh, what the stocking would look like. Uh, funding is done by the National uh, uh, Research and Development uh, Agency, 4 million euros, three years uh, to deliver. Uh, we want to make it faster. Uh, intercompatibility with CubeSat, Space VPX, Space Wire, um, uh, the and software. Um, so, uh, what we want you, we want you to cooperate with us. Uh, so, please join. Uh, I I want to follow the uh, address that we heard before. Uh, we need some cooperation. If you are interested, to talk to us. This is the moment because we are just setting standards. We will do whatever you think is worth doing. And this is final uh, note where we can be found. Thanks very much.
Are there any questions to kick, kick it off? Yes, over there. Marcus. Dominic. Uh, so, because uh, you, you are a private company, uh, so I assume it's supposed to be a commercial solution, but then you mentioned it open source. In what uh, aspect is it going to be an open source? Also well a bus only or components? The question is, most of the components, uh, there's probably one that we will not publish, and that will be the separation system. Uh, we already chose Astronica, uh, which is a Polish mechanical uh, 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 designing company. Uh, they are extremely uh, skillful. Th these are people who uh, m uh, designed, uh, produced and tested that Mupus penetrator. And uh, they are now e extremely cautious about patents. And they told us, okay, this is an open uh, uh, software project, but we would like to keep this close. I said, okay, we, we, you, you give us black box, uh, we don't care, but everything else will be open. Uh, it will be open source. So it will be open software and open hardware. Uh, that was the condition from our sponsors. So the Polish uh, research and development agency told us, okay, you'll get this money, but you have to publish. So we will publish. Any more questions, please? I have a question myself. Uh, which kind of payloads do you consider that uh, will benefit from this platform that wouldn't benefit from uh, multiple units, uh, CubeSat? Uh, this, is, this is a very good question. Uh, I think uh, that there is a tremendous potential for teledetection and uh, for optics. Uh, we are very close uh, uh, to my previous company, uh, Space Research Center, and uh, they are wor on working on two projects already, one on the ESA project, another one is being developed internally, and that has to do with optics. So uh, this is probably the third mission we will be flying. Uh, for now, we are booked for two astronomical missions. One is UV, one is RTG. And uh, another one uh, that probably will be technological uh, tryout. And uh, it has to do with uh, uh, diffraction optics. So this is uh, uh, the idea of having a telescope with much smaller focus length, focal length. And uh, that, they say, without much details, uh, they would they would try to get to one meter and a half, uh, or maybe better. But one meter and a half is probably something we can get. So I think this is the difference you can you can pinpoint uh, talking about the difference between what we offer and uh, and a CubeSat. Another thing is that because of the space BPX combination and scalability, uh, we can say what do you want to fly. How much memory do you want? Uh, one of the guys, uh, one of the astronomers who will be looking at the uh, uh, stars in UV says, would you please keep data for 10, da for ten days? W so if, if there's no contact, he doesn't want to lose it, but he's constantly lo uh, watching. So he said, I need 200 gig, uh, gigabyte memory on board. I said, uh, you can have more. Put SDs into those crates and uh, you can have you know, double it or whatever. So uh, you have another example of uh, what is the advantage. There is scalability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. I have one more question here from Klaus. Yes. Uh, uh, connecting to the other question about the payloads. Uh, I, I have to say I don't, if you make the exception of the CubeSats, I don't understand so much why a lot of people want to standardize the form factor of the bus because it will put a lot of constraints on your on your possible payloads, especially if you are speaking about astronomy and optical systems. I mean, sometimes you have so, so strong requirements on the, on the thermal, uh, uh, thermal uh, stability of your system and of, of the st uh, stability of your optical bench that I think with these kinds of standardized uh, uh, form factor approaches, you will have m more problems than uh, if you would build a if you would build a dedicated bus for the for the payload. 
Well, to tell you the truth, I don't see the advantage of building a dedicated bus. If we have a standard bus, what we tell you is, please use the VPX standard connector. This is what we want. No, I mean, I mean, from the thermal, from the thermal stability point, for example, for the for the for the optical instrument, yeah. So you have to have so many millikelvins over uh, over uh, uh, over your instruments of thermal stability, and uh, and and normally that is done by carefully designing the bus for the you for the obviously have to adjust and tailor to a particular solution so you have a machine with a particular requirement then obviously you have to do it uh, ra radio people told me we can't do a universal design everything is impl uh, is impacted on the shape so if you put a panel that already influences your characteristics of the antenna so obviously Every mission has to be looked at uh, as far as requirements of the payload. But in general, you know, talking about uh, the, uh, the data throughput, the memory and things like it, obviously it's standard. But then you have a special requirement, we have to cater for it. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Then I will have to say thank you very much, Tom. So in closing the session three, I have to ask you, did you enjoy the last session? Did you get something out of this? The operating systems, the bus, the experience, very good. And now we'd like to move on to the work group and to explain exactly what's coming next, I'd like to hand over to Red. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, one, two. Ivan, can you... Yeah, only you can, can, sorry, you can hear me. Yeah, so this is working. So now we're going to have work groups, or round tables, call, call it as you want. Uh, we have topics there, quite interesting, uh, especially those of uh, uh, Limbo Space Foundation. They have seven votes and they came seven. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. So uh, I listed those, and I want all the people from the t those topics and those from the internet to come on stage, because you're going to have one or two sentences about the topic before we go discuss them. So this means uh, open source software framework for CubeSat, Nikiras, please come on stage. Nikiras, yeah, you put your name there. Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> come. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. N next, uh, you will get the uh, microphone. Moon on Rails with Jose. Yeah, good. Make money with open source or open source business models with Philip. Where's Philip? Yeah, good. Uh, we have model based engineering with Kartik. Open source trajectory visualization with uh, Juan and Elge. You can come together. This is a lovely family. <laughs> Julia and Python. I don't know which kind of baby that makes, but uh, open source instrumentation and ground support equipment with Mantos. Mantos, where are you? Ah, haha. And agile methodologies for space missions. Zabis Crespo, if I'm pronouncing. Yeah, perfect. So maybe Nikitas, you can uh, have one or two sentences. Uh, yeah. Where are you? Uh, open source software framework for CubeSats, quickly. So we've seen a lot of uh, frameworks presented today. So. I think we need to get together and discuss about what we could do together and form a community. Yeah. That's also add some testing. <laughs> okay. So those who are interested with that, please join Nikitas. Then I have Moon on Rise with uh, Jose. Uh, okay, so today I heard a lot about um, uh, standards. Uh, everyone wants standards. So my things, my thoughts is that for a standard to succeed, it must be easier to use the standard than to come up with your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically our framework, M1 Rails, it uh, reads your source code and then wraps the standard around it. So that you, you don't even need to know the standard in order to start using it. If you have an hands-on experience with the uh, Arduino, you can just come and bring your laptop and play around. Okay, good. So I have uh, Stero now. Uh, Model-based uh, engineering with uh, Kartik. 
Um, yeah, so I, many of you might have heard the idea that software is eating the world, and I think it's uh, happening in space uh, slowly as well. Um, and, and so this topic of model-based systems engineering is towards an idea of imagining a completely virtual representation of your satellite and being able to operate on it and do everything on it purely in software before you ever touch a piece of hardware. Um, and this is particularly interesting for, uh, to the open community where if you're strapped for cash and you don't have a lot of capital, um, whether this offers an opportunity to open the doors and uh, reduce the barriers for entry to space. Super. And uh, of course, uh, visualization uh, for trajectory? So you planned your perfect mission. And you don't have enough pretty pictures. And you don't care if it's in Julia or Python. Exactly. It should run in the browser. And Interactively. We exactly. We would like to talk about that. Please come. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> then we have open source instrumentation and ground support equipment with Mantos. OK, th I think the title is uh, self-explanatory, but uh, we need to talk about tools we ne needed to, inv to invent uh, when we are building our satellite and what we need more to build uh, really open source. Yeah. So we have <laughs> agile methodologies for space missions. Yeah. So yeah, everyone is, is talking about uh, standardizing the, the platform, the bus, uh, and I think the, the end goal is decreasing the time to market because you, you need money to build a uh, CubeSat. Uh, and so, yeah, I wanted to discuss if if the agile methodologies can help us decrease this time to market as they, they have done like in, in the software business and if that's possible in the hardware and especially in the space industry. Perfect. And uh, now maybe Philip, yes. a small word about open source business models or you said it make money with open source? Yes, uh, when I wrote that, I didn't expect standing here, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you hear me? Yeah? Okay, um, so I would think about some business models, how to make money with open source, uh, because in the end, everybody has to pay his bills, and I wanna do that without starting a fight with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should have them at your table. Yeah. So that's, uh, you, you can control them. <laughs> uh, so you're all responsible of those topics. So there you will find A3 papers. You can, you can uh, pick uh, one or, or 10 sheets and, and pens as well. We will all move to the canteen. Uh, know that now it's uh, 1636 and uh, the coffee shop is still open until 5 so you can grab some stuff there and uh, what else after what, what else did I forget that's it and uh, those those topics will also be uh, worked tomorrow so if you want to keep on one topic uh, fully today you can and tomorrow you can you can go on another and if you have another topic that uh, that y you wanted to to tackle please feel free to to take a table and uh, and just invite people to to join you yeah be back here at uh, quarter to six so yeah so we'll come back here at quarter to six so we have the wrap-up yeah uh, you have the th i can keep it now <laughs> okay, cool. yeah. so uh because I, su I suspect that many people would like to follow more than one and you know, like we need to Feel accommodate free to that. To switch. Of course, you can switch around and move around. Although we would like you to be focused on the conversation, so you can be as productive and participative as possible, which, which is the point of the workshop. Um, I would like to ask the leads of the sessions to somehow keep some kind of documentation. I'm not going to be. Uh, we don't want to force people to do something specific. Like you need to do like this template. You know, fill this out. And <laughs> but uh, at least you know, like whenever there is yeah. links that are popped up, ideas, contacts, like who was part of the session, and you know, you want to share that back with everyone else, um, so that we can gather all together and we can send an email to all of you, so that you can follow conversations or what happened there. So that's going to be extremely helpful, I think, for everyone and make us feel a bit better for not, you know, being on all of them. So. No, it's right. It's right. So people outside also can see what happened, and we can share this uh, knowledge which is created tonight. Okay, so uh, now it's time. You can leave the back here. Let's go.
Yeah. And uh, see you on the broadcast.